Welcome, my name is Joel Langell. I am a control systems security consultant within Global and a Stuxnet project member with CSFI. Today I'm going to walk you through uh, a Stuxnet attack on an actual running uh, Siemens WinCC uh, PCS7 host node. The reason I like to, to use this actual host environment is that you can see uh, aspects of Stuxnet um, that you would not typically see if you tried to invoke the uh, the worm on a non-operational uh, machine. What we have here is we basically have what's called a field PG. This is a Siemens development environment that includes both the step seven engineering tools to allow me to build and configure the system, uh, the PLCs and the operator stations that are um, a part of the overall architecture, as well as the WinCC human machine interface environment, which is actually used to interact with uh, running PLCs, programmable logic controllers, in an actual process. So this would be the tool that's, that's used by operators in uh, manufacturing facilities. So I'm going to close these down right now um, so that we can focus on our, our attack and Stuxnet is a very intriguing exploit because it it has so many different uh, export paths that it invokes as it's executing. It has the ability to self-replicate uh, through removable drives like USB flash media uh, using a vulnerability that allows auto execution of code without actually having the auto run feature enabled. It also can spread itself uh, in a local area network through a vulnerability in the Windows print spooler. Has the ability to spread through SMB by exploiting a Windows Server vulnerability around the RPC service. It also can copy and execute itself on remote computers, either through network shares or computers that are actually running a WinCC database, like the one that I have here. It also has the ability to copy itself into Step 7 projects. That's the engineering environment in such a way that it automatically executes when the Step 7 project is loaded. It can update itself through a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism within a LAN, and the exploits use a total of four unpatched Microsoft vulnerabilities, two of which are used for self-replication and two more that are used for escalation of privilege. Uh, it can contact a command and control server that allows an attacker to download and execute specific code, including providing upnets to Stuxnet. It also contains a Windows rootkit that hides its binaries. It bypasses uh, security products like common antivirus software packages. It's able to fingerprint a specific industrial control systems, primarily here the Siemens PCS7 environment, and modifies codes on the actual Siemens PLCs to allow potential sabotage or uh, impacting the operation of the facility under control of the PLC. And finally, what's quite unique is it has the ability to hide the modified code on the PLC, basically creating a rootkit for the PLC. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to focus on two primary areas. We're going to actually install the Stuxnet uh, worm on this host, and then we're going to look and analyze some of the um, code pieces that it leaves behind. So of course this particular export shows how it basically uh, on installation it, it checks to make sure that the operating system is, is, is a target vulnerable operating system. It checks the AV software and then what it does is once all of that has passed it invokes what's called export 16 which is the main uh, injection of the Stuxnet worm. We're going to focus on three areas today. We're going to focus on the installation of actual configuration files. We're going to focus on the rootkit and the two files that comprise the rootkit. And then finally, we're going to take a look at something unique and how it actually wraps a very critical device driver within the WinCC environment that's responsible for communicating with the PLCs. The first area of interest is in the System32 drivers directory. This will be the location that will actually see the rootkit 
files be installed. And what I want to do is I'm pointing your attention to two files right now that are uh, in this directory and you're going to see after we invoke the Stuxnet worm that it will actually put the uh, two additional files in this directory. I also want to call up the Windows INF directory and this is going to be the location where Stuxnet is actually going to invoke uh, and install some key configuration files. So I'm going to actually bring the cursor here down to an area uh, which will be used to show the insertion of a couple key files. So pay particular attention here to the OEM6 and OEM7 files. Okay. And finally, the last area is uh, the, the Windows System 32 directory, which is where the Step 7 device drivers are actually installed. I'm going to actually call up this driver so we can show you where it's at in here. S7OTBXDX. Okay, right here is our file of interest. That is one of the Step 7... Um, device OS driver files that's actually one of the files that WinCC uses to communicate with the PLC. What I want to do right now is I'm actually going to copy this file and I'm going to take a snapshot uh, of its contents by creating a, a hash that is quite unique. So if this file changes in any way that hash file is also going to change um, in its place. Okay, so now that we've got everything set up, we've reviewed the directories of interest, I'm now going to uh, talk about actually installing the Stuxnet worm on this machine. This is a, is a Linux image of what's on my infected USB drive, and Stuxnet consists of, of six files. The first four are .lnks, or shortcut programs, shortcut files, and the last two are the actual payload of the attack. Now, of course, I can't view this uh, in a Windows environment because that would be the mechanism that's going to be used to launch the attack on this host. So if I minimize this window, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in my USB drive and I'm going to let Windows go through and install the various drivers for this USB flash drive. And once that's complete, we're going to launch Stuxnet simply by opening up Windows Explorer and looking at the contents of that flash drive. Okay, so we're now complete. So let's start up a clean Windows Explorer session. Okay, and there's our flash drive F. Um, now, what I want you to do is pay particular attention to the contents of the flash drive on the right pane of Windows Explorer. You're going to see those six files and what's going to happen is as Stuxnet gets installed on this machine and the rootkit executes, those files are actually going to become hidden and they're no longer going to be visible. So let's come down here and simply browse. This is one of the vulnerabilities that's exploited by Stuxnet. Uh, previously undocumented O-Day. So as now as this opens you're going to see, there they are, you see the two temp files and you see the four shortcut files. And in a matter of seconds, as the root kit is now installed, those files are going to become hidden. And that's how I know that Stuxnet is successfully launched on this host. And they disappear. Okay. So, let's look at what this has done. So the first area is, is we're going to take a look at the root kit, which is installed in the Windows System32 drivers directory. So if I come over here and do MRX, you're going to see two new files in this directory, MRXCLS and MRXNET. These are the two components of the rootkit. MRX CLS is actually uh, used to invoke Stuxnet on reboot every time this machine restarts. And the MRX net is the component in the rootkit that actually hides those files from view within Explorer. Now what's quite unique about those, let me come down here to MRX, is if we take a look at the properties of this particular file, 
what you see is that this file has actually been digitally signed. As far as Windows cons is concerned, this is a valid driver, and this is something that Windows should allow to be installed. Now, there is a little bit uniqueness here in that the email address is not available, but you'll notice that Realtek signed this particular file. And also, if we look at the other one, mrxnet.sys, you'll see the same digital signature. Now, once this was, was uh, revealed, on approximately July 16th, VeriSign did revoke this digital certificate. But the developers of the code were expecting this, and they quickly developed a variant that used another digitally signed uh, certificate. Okay, so there's the root kit. The root kit's now in our driver's directory. I'm going to close this window because we don't need this anymore. I'm going to now go look in our, our INF directory, and there's four files of interest in here. The first one being OEM7A.PNF. Okay, you'll notice that in the original directory we only saw OEM6 and OEM7. Now what we actually see are the addition of two files, OEM6C and OEM7A. OEM7A is actually uh, the main payload of Stuxnet. Okay, you can see it's roughly 500 k bytes in size. OEM6C is a log file that's used uh, to keep track of, of different events and different exports that occur as, as Stuxnet runs its course. There's also a couple other files that are installed. Uh, these are the data and configuration files. One of them is named MDM ER IC3. So if we browse down the directory, there's MDM ER IC3.pnf. This actually is the data file that contains uh, various pieces of information that Stuxnet needs to execute and is something that can be altered uh, through the peer to peer network as the exploit or the vulnerabilities uh, change and the attack vectors change. There's also one last file, MDM CPQ. So if we go up, MDM CPQ3. This actually uh, contains configuration data that's also used by Stuxnet. So you can see in this particular directory there were four files that were installed. Now these are all encrypted so it would do no good to try to open these up and view their contents. Um, now the last directory is the one that contains the Siemens uh, S7 device OS driver, the one that we hashed earlier. So let's actually go down here and let's take a look at what Stuxnet did in the System32 directory to this file. One more page. Okay, now you'll notice something very peculiar. In our initial one we browsed this, there was the two executables and one DLL between these two executables. Now notice that there's two files. So let's take a look at this first one, okay? I'm going to actually copy this file and we're going to do a hash on that to see if it's actually the same file that was there before. Okay, so right up here in the left, there's the original file. I'm going to run a hash. And sure enough, those files are different. Okay, what's happened here is that Stuxnet has actually taken and wrapped a new driver inside the environment, which is the main mechanism it's now going to use to communicate with the PLCs. Now what's interesting is this new file that was created called OTBXSX. This was also placed in there after launching of Stuxnet. And if we take a look, you'll find out that that actually is the original OTBXDX file. You can tell by the hashes, the hashes are exactly the same. This file is the same. So what they've done is they've wrapped malicious code around a valid driver. So now they're able to intercept and control these PLCs as well as download embedded code. A couple few, uh, few other notes that are worthy of mention is that now if I were to install another USB drive into this computer, Stuxnet would actually install itself on that new USB drive. Another thing that's very interesting about Stuxnet is that it will eventually remove itself 
from this initial USB drive. I've seen that after launching the, the attack several times and leaving the USB drive in the machine, it will actually remove the code from this existing USB flash drive. I thank you for watching this demo. There is a very good detailed technical report that was published on September 30th by S Semantic uh, called w32.stuxnet dossier. I encourage you to read this document in order to learn more about Stuxnet and some of the aspects that I was not able to show you today. Thank you.